All right, uh, Bolivar, do you want to go ahead and get started? Yeah, no. Uh, let me start. Let me share. Share. All right, does everybody see it there? Yes. All right. Um, yeah, so I just kind of kind of go through a bunch of concepts, and they're pretty familiar from other languages too. Um, and I'll do my best at explaining. So, yeah, what we're going to cover is just data types and variables, functions, and kind of how control flow is handled and error handling. Um, last week, it was pretty nice that we got to build something. So we have some idea of how to uh, work with the functions and the kind of types and things like that. So now we just go a little bit more in depth. So with scalar types is kind of the first thing that the book explains. And we have we have integers, so sign and unassigned integers uh, going from 8 bit to 128 and even kind of tailoring to the uh, machine architecture. And basically sign variants store numbers as minus parentheses 2n minus 1 to 2n minus 1 1, which uh, pretty much means for I8 is uh, from negative 128 to 127. And for, so, sorry, yeah, I8 are signed integers and then unassigned in, uh, integers basically go from 0 to 255. That's for the 8 bit example. So I think. Yeah, last week we just did some unassigned uh, integers and uh, types. Now, one of the interesting things that um, Rust brings is how, how to handle integer overflow. So it uses tools complement wrapping, and I will defer to people that may have a better idea of what this is. Uh, so I try to get into it, but a little bit too much, but basically, um, it'll handle use to tools complement wrapping to handle uh, integer overflow silently. And the way it does this is by uh, using different methods. So the wrapping method that's going to wrap values and and add to it. It's also a, going to check uh, so return none if overflow occurs. So you can specify how to handle uh, integer overflow. Uh, the overflowing method, so returning Boolean uh, indicating right, true, or false, is it overflowing, yes or no, and saturating. Uh, so it's going to uh, clamp the results, the types minimum or maximum value. So, and uh, I think we're going to talk about it in error handling, where, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more then, but basically the integer overflow is going to be handled uh, di differently depending on the mode that you are. are you, if you're in the debug mode or if you're in the release uh, mode. Uh, so one is going to panic and debug, it's going to panic and then in release, it's gonna also panic, but kind of tell you how to handle it and whatnot. So we also have floating point numbers or floats, uh, or no, not floats, just floating point point numbers. Uh, we're gonna have uh, F32 to F64, and they're all signed, and it just depends on you know what we need uh, do we need a single precision or a double precision float um depending on yeah what we're trying to achieve 
we have, um, I guess I'm going very fast, but Boolean, so true or false, and then characters. Um, um, I thought it was cool that it also can have all these emojis. So it, uh, characters are four bytes in size and they're represented in uni Unicode scalar value. And they can also represent uh, more than ASC2. Um, and I think one of the things to uh, keep in mind here is that characters use single quotes as opposed to strings. And me coming from R, that's, uh, I guess, important because a lot of the times I interchange single to double quotes. I should get better at that, but um, Rust is a little bit more strict about that. We have compound types. Um, so we have tuples, uh, like in Python. So we can group uh, values of different types. So in this example, we have a uh, sign 32 bit, a uh, floating 64, and on a sign 8 bit, uh, representing, well, 500, so integer, and then a uh, float or what we would call an R, a double, um, and then an, an, again, an integer. So uh, it will handle just different types, and, but they have a fixed length. So we can replace a value, but we can't increase the number of um, um, types or elements that it has. We also have arrays, which are also going to be a fit length, uh, but these are collections of the same type. So we can start with, you know, five elements, one through five, and then Rust is zero in depth, so we can uh, access it by um, indexing at zero, that first element. So we initialize those arrays uh by saying you know what they're uh, letting a be three um they have a value of three five times and this is actually yeah sorry the a shorthand for what's commented out here which is if we were also just to put five times the value of three um and i just wrote kind of these this a uh, sentence of you're gonna for shorthand you're gonna have a value and in the square brackets you're gonna have the value of elements semicolon and then the number of elements so we want a value of three and we want it five times and accessing it uh, again it's zero based in the scene so it's pretty familiar for those that work on Python a lot more, um, where we have an array of five elements, or well, that first number is gonna be at zero, uh, or that first element is gonna be at zero, uh, and then the number one, sorry, the second element at one, et cetera, et cetera. So variables and mutability, mutability, and we touch on that last week with mute and let and all those things. So uh, by default, they're immutable. So once we um, <clears throat> do or write a statement as in let, e let x equal five, we can't uh, assign another number uh, or value to x by saying x equals six but we can make those variables mutable from the start by saying let mute mut, or I guess I'll use pronouncing mute, <laughs> but as a mutable, but uh, let y, let mut uh, y equal 10, and then we can change that value by declaring further uh, down below y plus, equals five, so we're gonna add that five to variable y.
We also have constants, uh, so they're declared with a uh, const, um, and they're always immutable. So you're gonna say constant mat score, uh, it's gonna be of unassigned 32 bit, and it's gonna be, um, I guess this is what, 100,000. So in Rust, you can do this where you uh, can make a number or values more legible by putting an underscore in between it. And this is the equivalent of 100,000 without that underscore. Uh, the constant, Constants must be annotated with a type. So here by saying uh, unassigned 32 bit. Um, and they can be declared globally or within a function scope. Um, but they cannot be computed at run time. So they have to be declared. So we also have shadowing, uh, which is Bit different. Uh, so shadowing allows that we reuse allows us to reuse variables. Um, so for example, here we say let x equal five, but then we use the statement let again by saying let x equal x plus one. So then that would shadow the previous x. Um, and further down below, we're basically doing the same uh, by saying let x equal x times two. Uh, I think I did this exercise. I don't remember what it printed out, but uh, it will print out the last uh, statement or expression. So I made this little kind of table to keep uh, mutt and shadowing um, you know, straight. So mutt, it has to be the same type versus shadowing. You can change the type when you use let. And uh, in terms of the use of uh, using the statement let um, with mutt, you can just use it the first time when it's first declared. But then with shadowing, you always have to use um, a statement let to uh, assign that new valuable. Um, so mut, you use let one time, and then with shadowing, you have to use it all the time. Now, functions in Rust. Um, they're very, we got into this, this last week. So we have, um, you know, lines one through four, the main function, hello world, right? And then we want to declare uh, another function and we can uh, de declare it below or above. Um, uh, this one, we're calling it another function, right? And it prints, this is another function. If I remember it, Correctly, the book really said that it, for Rust, it doesn't matter where you declare functions uh, be, because it will find them and and at compile time and and then use it wherever they are used. That, uh, in contrast to how I think of it in R, where we have like if I don't declare that function first or source the script that has that function uh, or load the package, it won't, um, it won't uh, recognize where that function is. Um, so uh, functions um, and parameters or arguments. So we can say, um, you know, function, we're gonna uh, have a, which is gonna be of type, Assign 32 bit or B, it's going to be again sign 32 bit. Um, and then those arguments uh, within that function. So, yeah, this was a function called add. <laughs> um, 
And functions are going to return the last expression uh, from the function body, right? So the last, um, I think in the Slack this week, we had this discussion of like, what's a statement, what's an expression? So um, this is an expression. It doesn't have a statement let, for example. And functions are going to return the value uh, that, uh, uh, that is a result of this expression. So any questions or uh, things to add? Okay. Let me see. Sorry. Let me see. scope. Sorry. The scope changes inside curly brackets. This is kind of expected for me as an R. Scope changes in the function. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is also quite new to me. So you can't reference those argument names when calling only the body. So, R. Oh, what do you mean, Jonathan, with this? Sorry. Um, so you have to pass the first argument and the second argument. It's purely by position. Those A and B, they're used inside the body, but like in R, you could call them in any order by name. And Rust just doesn't do that. Oh, okay. Okay, I have to, I have to play around with that. I haven't tried it. It seems okay. pretty odd to me because I feel like that's pretty common in like newer languages. Newer meaning not from like the 60s, <laughs> especially well, even more recent with like, I don't know how old Rust and Go lives and stuff. I think it seems weird. Mm -hmm. but... Okay. And then one so we would have to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mauro. I was going to change back to scope. So if you have an idea about um, parameters, go ahead, please. So yeah, so that where the parameters are going to go or in, depending on the scope that they're called. Do I, did I, did I understand your question correctly? <laughs> Sorry, say it again. Mauro. Ah, uh, no, no, sorry. I think I confused everyone here. Uh, no, my comment, what I meant to say is that my comment is about the scope that um, um, I agree that, you know, if you define a function, um, you know, in a script, if you define two functions, you know, the first one, uh, you know, the order matters, but I'm saying, but, you know, in a package that doesn't apply, which uh, kind of, it seems to me that, uh, that Rust works more like similar to the environment of a package than on a oh, or, or a script. So if you know if I have two functions in a package, it doesn't really matter the order. So that's kind of something that um, yeah, that reminds me to you know, okay. yeah, yeah, in a, in a in a package context, not in, in a script context. That's when it matters in a single script uh, instance. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, right, so control flow. So we have like like all the other languages. We have if if expressions. So we can start a function, function main, and then we say, you know, let number equal three. And then if a number is less than five, you're gonna print this, and then else you're gonna print this other. Uh, it is okay. Sorry. Uh, now it won't uh, automatically try to convert non-Boolean types to a Boolean, um, and so you always have to um, explicitly provide what it's it needs to to test, right, or check for. 
So, so uh, I think I can find an example soon, but it's in my notes. So then we have else if for multiple conditions. Uh, again, yeah, this is uh, similar to if and else. Um, so uh, we're saying, hey, you know, it, it is divisible by four or it isn't divisible or then else it's gonna be divisible by three or not divisible by four or three. Now, Rust only checks for the first block that returns true. Um, so, and it won't check the other conditions. Once it returns true, it, uh, you know, returns whatever you told it, right? It's going to print divisible by four. Um, so, and now when we use if and let statements, again, if is an expression uh, and we use it on the right hand side. Wait, did I write this right? Right hand side of the let statement? Yeah, right hand side of the let statement. So um, here we have let condition equals true, right? Then we have let uh, number if condition uh, is five or else six. Um, so that if, uh, so the let number, that's a statement, and then it has the expression if condition five or else six. Um, and then that number is bound to the value based on the outcome of that if expression. Uh, so I guess this is, I mean, interesting for me that to see it all in line and not just kind of a, an if statement in curly brackets. It's just uh, a one liner. Uh, of you know checking uh, what that variable is going to be under uh, under the condition of of that if statement. Now the values must be the same type. So you did I do it? Okay. So for example, you cannot do this where you're saying of or uh, if condition is five, else six. You're you're basically combining integers and then string types. And that's gonna have an error <clears throat> where uh, you you can't have it emit uh, types. It seems pretty pretty obvious, but now loops. Um, it's yeah, the book brings in this example, which is just kind of an infinite loop that uh, just prints running forever and we can't break it. And the way we break it is by adding a break, um, a break expression. So down here, break counter uh, times two, and then print the uh, result of that loop. So we have a statement that is going to run a loop, and that loop uh, also uh, it's basically a an if statement and it breaks um it breaks like the result is 20. i remember that correctly so the code the thing is that uh, if we were to have some code after where it says here break counter um times two uh it's just never executed because it, it'll break at break um so a tree breaks as an expression and it returns the value of that expression. Now, while loops, um, I, again, you know, whether a condition is true, this code is gonna run, otherwise it's it. Um, so I guess, yeah, this is pretty simple, just a while loop, keep doing it while it's true. And then we have for loops, and the book stresses out that it's the most commonly used construct. Um, let me check questions. And, and then 
So we have, yeah, we're, you're going to check this element in A, and then you're going to print the value of that element, right? So this we just print 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Now, I think this was uh, this is pretty cool where uh, in Rust, you can label loops to uh, just be more explicit and uh, don't get them mixed up, right? So like here, I just highlighted that this one was named counting up and it starts at line three and it ends at line 19. We could have had, you, we could have named this loop at line, uh, line seven, but since we just have two loops, we the book just wanted to show us that we can name them and keep one named and one unnamed. Now, uh, one of the interesting things is that the, it only has uh, one uh, quote, a single quote before the, the label name. Um, it's just some syntax to keep in mind that you're gonna name a loop, it's gonna be quote counting up and then it doesn't need an end quote. Now, error handling. So with the integer overflow that I uh, talked about in the integer section, so you have two modes, right? Um, debug mode, it's going to panic on overflow and basically not uh, compile. And then release mode, it's going to use tools complement wrapping and apply all these methods that I uh, um, talked about. So basically, in deep, debug mode, you're gonna you're gonna know that there's a problem if you're uh, at that moment and you can handle it. If you're using release mode, it'll compensate and try to to handle uh, the overflow in one of these using one of these methods. Um, as you just an example of an invalid array access, so we have an array of five elements, and then we're trying to index array or element number 10, uh, and it's going to throw an error and say it's out of bounds. Um, or right, if we're saying it's going to cause a, a panic. Now, I made this uh, chart. Uh, it's going to live in this presentation to so just kind of know some differences uh, or like things to keep in mind and i'm not necessarily going to go over it but i wanted to see just in table form how the languages compare and right we we a lot of us come from r or python or things like that so how does it compare to others um in terms of of these uh data types uh so this is just a little list that you can all check or copy and have it for reference just as we get better uh, with this language. So, and then I just, some practice exercise is a lot of what has we can, um, in terms of using functions and whatnot, but last week we really kind of uh, got our feet wet with uh, using functions and uh, handling errors a little bit. So there's a strict typing, there's immutability control, and uh, I guess advanced uh, yeah, error handling, I would say, but I'm not exactly sure how other languages handle it. Um, and then Rust just has you know, some safety guarantees with the whole having a debug mode and having uh, a release mode where you can notice those potential errors um, in, and handle them, handle them more efficiently. Yeah, and that's all. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Let me see the, the chat if there was a required bool for if statements, my dream, Malcolm. Uh, 
can see something on this freaking other things are logical. Number one equals true, true thing. Okay. What is wrong? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty standard language in that sense, <laughs> except for the, you know, error handling and the whole mutability and things like that. Um, yeah, I think this is the last chapter where kind of covering the, well, actually, this is the point of this chapter, because these are the things that this language has in common with several other languages. Although they're, like you said, they're a little different, like the uh, Booleans are required. You can't just use any type that, that's got a truthy value like a lot of languages do. But um, I think the next chapter will start getting into the very first big differences yeah. with Rust, with the borrowing and borrow checkers. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, it's with the, the ownership the ownership ownership yeah that's, that's yeah what was, yeah so it's actually this is that's how i think what i made that table to this is where it's similar and yeah and we can kind of keep it straight of uh how it how how it compares to other languages but then every it's actually i had a little bit of ownership in that table but left it out um just to tackle it next week of semicolon for uh, expression and statements that difference that's very tricky because if you forget the semicolon and you may just spend hours wondering what am I doing wrong and it's just a single semicolon uh, yeah 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 the statement semicolon and then the expression no semicolon yeah but I I guess it helps if uh or for me i'm i'm trying to drilling it in my head of like let is a statement right and let mut is a statement and that always needs that if it doesn't have it then just try i'm just trying to memorize that <laughs> Cool, I guess, you know, it's short, so we can leave it there, or if you all don't have anything to add, thank you for, for your time. Yeah, I mean, if we don't have any more questions or comments, I think it's, it's worth kicking in for pretty 20 minutes back. Um, <laughs> we've got the next couple of weeks, um, Oh, you know what? Let me put, let's put stop in the chat. So.